might grow in our commitment to you through your Son. And so we pray in his name. Amen. There are some stories that are more myth than history, it seems, but the idea has taken on. It's a powerful concept. It's the story of a general who, as he approaches an invasion, and it's an invasion that began by sea. It might be Julius Caesar in 53 B.C. as he brings his legions to Great Britain, although it's not known as Great Britain then. But as he, as he comes, the myth is that he has his soldiers look back over the cliffs and the ships, their ships, are on fire. Again, it may not be historically accurate, but there's a reason it became a part of a poem and a song that that was how committed he wanted his soldiers to be. Committed. The, the idea of being in. There's no turning back. There's no retreat. There's not even a return trip home. You have to go forward. You have to be committed. And so no, this morning, the sermon is not about being committed to a certain institution. That's a different sermon, okay? Somebody asked me that. Like, what? Committed? Do I need to be committed? No, we'll, we'll get to that next Sunday, all right? Or if you want to show up for that one. But as you, if you picked up a copy of the handout, if you look on the screen, it's there. That's our question today. Are we, are you, committed? And then we could ask, well, to what, right? If you, if you look at a, a search engine, an image search engine, almost all the pictures you get, if you type in the word committed or commitment, are about marriage. Now, I, I think maybe it's a good thing that there's at least some still attachment or association in our culture with that idea of commitment and marriage. Now, that's part of the reason people aren't getting married, right? Because they don't want to make a commitment. But that isn't what we're asking this morning, is it? We might could add on to that question, are you committed, and add the name Jesus. That's the, that's the question today. Am I committed to Jesus? What does that look like? Does it look like giving Jesus maybe an hour or two on a Sunday morning? If, he, if you're lucky, you throw in a Sunday night, maybe a Wednesday night. When you're in trouble, you say a prayer. And you tell people, if they ask you, well, you know, what are you religiously? Oh, I, I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus. Is that all it means to be committed to Jesus? If we wanted to put this in one verse, and this isn't our verse for the day, but it's just a, a one-verse idea. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, might be a good candidate. It's where we read of the idea of being crucified. Talk about commitment. Being crucified with Christ. It's the words of Paul saying, I have done this. And he says, it's not really me that lived. Being a Christian is, I, I died. I, I was crucified with Jesus. I died to the old man. I was buried with Jesus in baptism. I'm a new person. And it's really that now, the rest of my life, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what it means to be a committed follower of Jesus. That's really what it means to follow Jesus, is His love and then my faith and my life returned. We know what Jesus has done in His life. The eternal God who took on flesh, who lived and died and rose again and ascended on high as King. The question today is more about my response to that. Am I committed? We could put it this way then. There's, a, there's one verse. Now here's one statement. That being a follower of Jesus means I am all in. 
the handout says being all in, so there's the observation, but then make it personal by what's on the screen. It means that I am all in. Is that who I am as a Christian? Let's look at it together. Let's do three things this morning, for the rest of my time up here with you at least. Let's look at life or death. Is this about life? Or death? Is it that serious? Committed. And then a couple of more examples, because that first one's about an example too. And then we'll look at it, the value system that it takes to be truly in or committed. Let's look at those together this morning. First then, life or death. You might have said that at some point in your life. You've said this is a matter of life and death, or this is a matter of life or death. It's that important, that essential. Isn't that how I see being a Christian? That serving Jesus is life or death. And even more than that, it doesn't matter whether I live or I die. The one thing that will remain true for me and of me is that I am for Jesus. Let's open up now to the letter Paul wrote by inspiration to the Philippians. We're going to pick up in Philippians chapter 1 about verse, well really verse 18, but as you look at these verses, one of the other questions to ask of Paul now, as if Paul were standing here, instead of just writing a letter to us, he's standing here and we say, Paul, what's your focus? What are you really committed to? And, and if, if Paul's answering, and, and he's being a bit, maybe more, he's, he's being truthful, not just humble, and remember, he, he writes by God's Spirit here, he'd have to say, my focus is on the cause of Jesus. It's not on my own personal conveniences and comforts. It, it, my focus is not on the advancement of my own reputation, my own success in life. But aren't those the kind of things we tend to focus on as humans? Focus on getting ahead ourselves? Advancing our personal agendas? Our cause, to reuse that word? Instead of the cause of Christ? In verses 12 through 18, Paul is so focused, so committed, that he even says, I'm happy when people preach Jesus trying to hurt me. Verses 12 through 18. There were some people somehow that were telling people about Jesus and telling the truth, trying to make things worse for Paul. And Paul says, as long as Christ is preached, whether it hurts me, whether that's why they're trying to do it, I'm all in. And then let's pick up in verses 18. It's the last part of verse 18 that makes a new paragraph. 18 through 26 of Philippians chapter 1. The handout says 2. I don't know who wrote the handout. I wrote the slides. And I didn't change the slide right before services. Okay, It's it's been a week. But it's chapter 1. We'll get to chapter 2, Lord willing, in a moment. But in verses 18b through 26 of Philippians 1, Paul describes his current situation. Here's his circumstances. They are life or death. And he says, it doesn't matter what happens to me, all that matters to me is the cause of Christ. The gospel is spread, people grow in the gospel, life or death. Verse 18, he says, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed. But, look at this one, that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Can I say that with Paul today? I'm not, I'm not sitting in prison. We don't know for sure where Paul is or the exact conditions. This seems to be some kind of house arrest at this point still. 
but it's not great. And throughout this section and throughout the rest of the letter, you get this vibe from Paul that he doesn't know for sure. I mean, he has his expectations, and he knows what he thinks is going to happen, but there's things are up in the air. He doesn't know if he's going to get out of prison alive or not. And eventually, we know from history, Paul is executed by the Roman state. Paul says, it doesn't matter. If I'm alive, I'm going to honor Jesus. I'm going to serve and praise Jesus. And then if I die, I die in a way that honors Jesus. I'm all in. Look at the next statement. This is one you've, you've probably heard quite a bit if you've been a Christian for very long or been a part of, of anything related to Christianity. It's one of those refrigerator verses, but it's right here in this section about Paul being in prison, possibly to be executed. For, he explains... To me, to live is Christ. Living is about the Messiah, getting to enjoy this life with him now, getting to experience being in his family with you. But, he also then says, to die is gain. It's, it, it's financial language. It's, I'm going to make a profit if I die. Committed. Could that be my motto? Would it be true that to live is Christ, to die is gain? Either way, I have Christ. Or am I too focused on something else? Too focused on my job? Too focused on my retirement? Too focused on, you fill in the blank. And then these verses, verse 22 now. He says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And then he says, I'm, I'm between a rock and a hard place. Or I'm pulled in two different directions. I, I really don't know which one I'd choose. You ever been there in, in, that, in a small, tight, restricted space? I don't want to get too detailed because some of you are going to get claustrophobic on me just by me talking about it. But I think about a place in Tennessee called Rock City. Some of you might have at least seen some of the signs. They're on the interstate, see Rock City. And I didn't name this, look it up. They call it this. They call it the Fat Man's Squeeze. And I couldn't get a picture that's not copyrighted, so that's not it. It's a really tiny passage between the mountain, between the solid rock on each side. And almost everyone has to turn sideways and you can feel the mountain scraping against you as you pass through. That's what Paul says here. Look at it. Read verse the rest of this. He says, Yet which I shall not choose, I, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. There's that image. My desire on the one hand is to depart and be with Christ. I'm ready to take up, pull up anchor. For that is far better. But... To remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. I can do more for you and other Christians. I can serve more. I can teach more. I can work more for Jesus now. And so he says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. That's where he comes back around and says, I, I think this is what's going to happen. But he says it doesn't matter. Paul doesn't have a death wish here. He, he's not depressed and to the point where he's hoping, okay, I, I, I just want to die. As we read the whole letter, the letter is full of life and joy and excitement. Even here, as soon as he's out of prison, he's ready to go right back to work again. I mean, he's still working in prison for that matter, right? But it's this commitment where he is, he's come to terms, life or death, because I'm committed to Jesus. And yet the worst we face in our world, this little part of our world, is the mockery, the laughter of our contemporaries if we take a stand for what's right, 
if we speak up for what's true. We, we, we face the horror of deciding, do I sleep in on a Sunday morning or not? Think about it. We compromise with worldliness in the way that we dress, in the way that we talk, in the jokes we tell, or the jokes we laugh at that other people tell. And here is Paul, imprisoned, because he's preaching Jesus, and he says, life or death, I'm committed to Jesus. Life or death. Let's keep reading. We go across the page now to Philippians chapter 2. And we see two more examples of this commitment. Let's pick up in verse 17, although we'll focus in on verses 19 through the end of the chapter. In verse 17 and 18, you get a bit more of Paul's commitment. And so this makes the transition flow, I think. He says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. It's kind of wordy. But he's saying, you're like the sacrifice, and then on the altar, there's a drink offering poured out as well. Oil or wine or something's poured out on top of the sacrifice. That's me. He says, even if that happens, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Now in verses 19 through 24, he writes about young Timothy and his dedicated care. Is this section just Paul giving them an update, saying, Timothy's going to come to you, you need to know that, heads up, and then let me me give you some update on Epaphroditus. Is that all this is? Or is it that, and then here's two examples, visible examples, of what it means to be like Jesus in the previous section, to be humble, to seek not your own glory, your own interest, but to serve even to the point of death. That's Philippians 2, 1 through 11. And now if you want to see somebody right there before you in flesh and blood, here's two guys to think about. Verse 19, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Nobody like Timothy, Paul says, who has such heart. Could that be another part of commitment? That when I'm committed to something, it's not just my head that's involved, it's my heart that's connected. I don't just agree, yeah, this is a good thing to do, maybe I'll get around to it. It's more that I I make a decision with all of me, with my emotions involved too. Now, keep in mind, this isn't about temporary feelings. I mean, Paul has his struggles. Even in this section, he talks about his anxiety and his sorrow. We're still going to be human. That's not commitment isn't somehow becoming inhuman. where We're impervious and not vulnerable to anything. It's that those temporary feelings don't change the head and heart decision, commitment I've made. That that belief in Jesus, that commitment to Jesus, that this is who I am, remains. And here it involves care for others. Do you see that in this passage, that being concerned or caring about Jesus is parallel with our concern for each other. What would that look like in a church, in a home life, where we're committed with our hearts into it? Look at what he says about Timothy. He says, For they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. So if I seek Jesus' interest, I seek your welfare. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Dedicated servants. Then Epaphroditus. He's only mentioned 
These two times, here in Philippians 2 and then later in Philippians 4, in the entirety of the Bible. And yet he shines as one that Paul says, you need to honor the people like this, respect people like this, because of their risky service. Have you ever taken a risk for being a Christian? It, it may be that Christianity has been too popular, too accepted in our culture for so long. Now that's changing, sure. But it's easy to become complacent. The language used here of Epaphroditus is gambling language. Epaphroditus was willing to roll the dice for Jesus. Take a risk. That's what he says. Verse 25, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker, fellow soldier. He says, he has worked beside me. He has stood on the battlefront beside me. We fought together and worked together. Epaphroditus. There's that, that rule we talk about within churches, within real estate. It gets used in a lot of different contexts. The 80-20 rule. Some, say, some people say maybe it's the 90-10 rule, where 20% of the people do 80% of the work and vice versa. If more of, of us were committed like Epaphroditus to risk whatever it takes to be involved, to serve, Jesus to serve the church, to serve people. We might make some improvement on those kind of rules or statistics. He says this about Epaphroditus. He's been your messenger and minister to my need. They sent him like an agent to serve Paul for them. They couldn't all go to visit Paul. They sent Epaphroditus. He has been longing for you all, heart, and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Do you get that? That Epaphroditus is upset, not because he got sick, but because the Philippians were upset because they heard he got sick. Focus. Commitment. He says, indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Lest my anxieties keep building. I am more eager to send him, he says, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. There's that human element. So, here's the bottom line here. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died. Why? For the work of Christ. Risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. In 252, in the city of Carthage, plagued by some illness, the pagans began to make their escape. They left the dead bodies in the street and the sick with them. And it was the Christians who saved the ancient city, Carthage, by taking the risk to bury the dead and tend to the sick. And that's one example of quite a few throughout history where Christians have been like Epaphroditus, they actually, in English, there were a group of ancient Christians in the early church known as, this is, this is funny to us, as the gamblers. It's because they were a special group of Christians that would go visit people like Paul in prison, risking life and limb, and they would go visit and take care of sick people who might have a contagious, infectious disease. So when we turn the camera and peer back at ourselves, just how committed am I to Jesus? Two more examples. Timothy and Epaphroditus. A commitment to him. 
Let's turn maybe now to the next page, Philippians chapter 3. It almost seems like Paul's ending the letter. He's given them information about person, persons that are coming to them, and now he says, finally, in chapter 3. But then Paul was a preacher, and so he says, in conclusion, more than once. And so you get finally in chapter 3, verse 1, you get therefore, brothers, in chapter 4, verse 1, and then you get another finally in chapter 4, verse 8. And then he begins to actually end the letter. Take a look with me at chapter 3, verses 4 through 11. Paul's talking about people that have confidence in different parts, different aspects of life, some in the flesh, some in the spirit. And so he writes this, Philippians 3, verse 4, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He says this, being circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the kingly tribe, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. You want a pedigree? I've got it. And then he has a really strange... I use the word odd, way of balancing the budget. Because that's what Paul does here. The language he uses is like you're writing out your budget or you're balancing your checking account and you've got your, your outcome, income, you've got the negative, positive, debit, credit, all of that. And here's all the things that would be on the positive side, right? And then Paul scratches them out and moves them over to the negative side. Because he found something of value that makes all the other things, in comparison, worthless. Verse 8, Philippians chapter 3. At the end of verse 7, end of verse 8, he says, but whatever gain, there's that positive Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. This isn't that nothing else in life has any value to me at all. This isn't that I leave behind my family and I quit my job and I don't have any hobbies. That's not the idea. Although there might be times when I do need to give up something to serve Jesus, sure. Sacrifice instead of compromise. This is about my value system. What really matters to me? Am I willing to say that Jesus is truly better than everything else and anyone else in my life? And if it came down to it, I'd give up it all to go with Jesus through his cross to the resurrection on the other side to know Jesus. Read through verse 11 as he tacks on reason after reason why serving and being committed, being all in is worth it. Because, he said, Jesus is truly better. Now it's when we ask ourselves then, right? What's my value system? If somebody pulled my life aside and looked at it, critiqued it closely, and see the point here is not to do this about somebody else, but it's to think, what if that was me? What if I was in the review board of commitment to Jesus, if that was a thing, what would they find? What would be the verdict? If you were in a more legal setting and the gavel falls, what would it be? Maybe instead of innocent or guilty, it's committed to Jesus or not. Committed. We've seen this morning a life or death situation where the Christian says, life or death, if I live, great. If I die, great. It's all for Jesus. We've seen two examples 
two more examples of Christians who were willing to be dedicated to service, to pour their hearts into people. And a Christian who was willing to lay it all on the line and risk everything for Jesus. And what that looked like was serving people. And the reason why, you see, if I'm asking myself, well, how do I do that? I want to be committed like Paul. I want to be committed like Timothy and Epaphroditus and all those Christians like that, that we sometimes think of as these almost unreal, they almost are superhuman. But we know they weren't. We read some of that already. The secret, if you want to call it that, to being committed to Jesus, to being a follower that's all in is in having the value system where I realize it's because nothing, when I'm real about it, nothing can compare to Jesus. Committed. In 1964, they brought in a group of the Gurkhas the soldiers from Nepal. And they began to ask these soldiers if they'd be willing to fly over into Indonesia, to jump out of the plane, to fight. And they were kind of nervous about it. They, they didn't really understand the concept. And so they said, well, can you fly real low, maybe 100 feet off the ground, over a real swampy part? And then it was explained, well, if we do that, if we fly that low, your parachutes won't have time to open properly. And the Gurkhas replied, wait, you didn't mention parachutes before. I said, we're going to have parachutes? What were they? Can you say it with me? They were what? All... In. Parachute or not, they're jumping out. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of glad that Jesus doesn't ask me to jump out of an airplane with a parachute or not. It's not necessarily what Jesus asked of me. But he does ask, he does call for commitment. Not a half-hearted, yeah, but a full, committed, all in. If you need to be a Christian, if you need to be a Christian today, and we can help you, let us know. We stand and sing together.